Okay. So first, the most important policy level is the national level because really it's individual states that set the rules for what's going on in their countries. Um, so there are various questions you have to answer. What kind of threats am I going to require the operators using these things to protect against? What kind of specific security measures am I going to uh, require them to do? Because in principle, you might have only a, a performance-based system where you just say, protect against this level of threat and how you do it is your business. Um, but in reality, every system I'm aware of combines performance-based measures it, with prescriptive measures where they say you've got to have a fence of this height and, and locks of you know this type and, and so on. Or they don't have any of the performance measures at all and it's only prescriptive. From the point of view of a regulator, actually a prescriptive system where you just say this is what you have to have is way easier because then the inspector doesn't have to have judgment. They can just say, have you got it? Have you not got it? Right? Whereas if you have a performance-based system, the inspector has to exercise a lot of judgment about, well, does this system, the way they're explaining it to me, actually meet the performance uh, standard? Uh, on the other hand, a performance-based system is usually a, a, a better overall approach. Um, how should the security measures vary with the kind of material? Not every material is as easy to make a bomb from as every other. Some materials you might need to process pretty substantially in order to make a bomb from. And so you have to make assumptions about, well, how much, how much can I sort of reduce security measures for material that would be, you know, down the street from us at MIT, for example, they have 12 and a half kilos of weapon-grade highly enriched uranium in the core of their research reactor. But it's you know, fabricated into fuel elements where the uranium is bonded with aluminum. It's inside the core of an unusually high power research reactor, five megawatts thermal, so it's quite radioactive. You know, if I were a terrorist wanting to steal nuclear material, I probably wouldn't be at the top of my list, but still, it's weapon grade highly enriched uranium. And so you have to think about, well, how much do I reduce the security given those characteristics of the material compared to the security I might have for, you know, plates of 90% enriched highly enriched uranium metal. Um, how much will it cost? Who's going to pay those costs? So how much does the government pay versus how much does the operator pay? Um, how do we strengthen the security culture? This is, I would say, one of the hardest problems. Uh, you know, we in the United States have repeatedly failed to achieve good security culture at various of our nuclear facilities over the years. And then trying to then influence it in other countries where we don't really understand the national culture very well and we only have you know, one pinky on the levers of power, this is an extremely difficult policy problem that uh, people have been working on for a, a long time with only modest degrees of success, I would say. Uh, who's in charge when there's a real incident? How do we make sure that uh, parties actually coordinate? So, a lot of facilities, for example, they have some guard forces there at the site, but they really rely heavily on the local police or whatever to provide additional guard, additional forces that would arrive. Well, so how do you make sure that's actually going to happen? How do you set up the coordination between the site and the local police forces? Do they actually carry out exercises uh, to practice and, and this kind of thing? Uh, many of those questions are answered in regulations, uh, but you know, not every regulator is equal to every other regulator. Uh, some regulators uh, don't have very strong regulations. Um, uh, you know, it used to be in the United States, for example, uh, that, um, well, originally in the United States, uh, if you were a private owner of plutonium or high enriched uranium, there were literally no rules at all about how secure it had to be. Because the theory was, this stuff is valuable and companies will protect it to protect their own financial asset. And that people didn't think about, by the way, the value to society of what might happen is way bigger than the value to the company uh, of the material. Uh, and then when initially we had rules, they were pretty modest little rules. You know, initially you had, you know, if you were shipping a whole bunch of plutonium, you had to have like a couple of armed guards. You know, now we have more serious rules. So, uh, but in various other countries, uh, they still have pretty modest rules. And then the question is, how well are the rules implemented and enforced? You can have really good rules, but if they're not implemented and enforced very well, and in particular, in a lot of countries, inspectors from a regulator might get paid $1,000 a month, something like that, 
they might find a violation that would cost $2 million to fix. It's an obvious incentive for the operator to <laughs> give the inspector some money to ignore the, the violation. So there was a guy busted for doing, uh, an inspector busted for demanding bribes uh, to overlook security violations in Russia at one of the closed nuclear cities in the nuclear weapons complex a few years ago, for example. Um, so regulation is, is really hard to make sexy, but incredibly important. Uh.